Great. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kate Tallman, and I am the chair of the Environment and Climate Network's Sustainability Excellence Awards. I would like to welcome you here today and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the Environment and Climate Network, in partnership with three uh, AAM professional networks, have worked very hard this month to bring you tailored content that really addresses your specific experience. Um, and interest in climate action and sustainability in the cultural sector. Uh, our first session was on the first week of April. That was in partnership with NAME, where we hosted a conversation about sustainable exhibits and uh, the potential steps forward. Our second session last week was in partnership with the uh, AM's LGBTQIA plus alliance. And we spoke with three representatives from uh, two different Smithsonian institutions and the Smithsonian Research Program about environmental justice initiatives in their communities. And today's session is our last and final session before Earth Day next week. And we have had the privilege of partnering with EDCOM to speak with three representatives uh, about their individual institutions' efforts towards encouraging public action in their communities. So each of these uh, events will be recorded and on demand. So if you have not had the chance to join us live today, or if you are interested in some previous events that we've hosted this month, uh, keep an eye out for those. And finally, I would like to encourage you, if your institution has a green team, or if your uh, museum has a sustainability page on their website, or if you've incorporated climate action or sustainability into your, your museum mission statement or strategic plan, please reach out to the ECN. We are compiling a list of organizations doing this work and we hope that it'll act as a resource to those who are interested in making those steps in their own institution and um, are maybe looking for for some pointers so without further ado i would like to hand the mic over to mary ruth leftwich from edcom who will be our moderator today and uh, express my thanks to both mary ruth and each of our speakers for being with us Wonderful. Thank you, Kate. Good afternoon, everyone, depending on your time zone. Um, I am Mary Ruth Leftwich. I work for the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation as the Senior Director of Museum Operations and Education and um, have the privilege of chairing Ed Conversations this year for the Education Committee that's part of AAM. And I, when we were approached for EdCom about doing this partnership, the first thing that really sprung to mind is work that I had done prior to EDCOM with the Museum Education Roundtable and the ways that we tried to sort of convene conversations around important topics through the Journal of Museum Education. And two of our speakers today are connected to an article, or excuse me, to an issue, a special issue that was done last year on the 50th anniversary that really looked at museums and public climate action and ways that we can, particularly through the lens of education, work to galvanize interest and really make sure that museums are seen as a place where this work could, should be done. Because right? so I think that's one of the questions that you'll see kind of come up across all of our presenters today is the role that museums should play in terms of making sure that the public is engaged in thinking about climate. So um, the ability to work with ECN and partner also meant we were able to bring in um, folks from their side and we are excited to sort of kick off our session today with Claudia Tibbs from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And then each of our presenters will um, introduce the next speaker that will follow them. And at the end of the session, we'll have a Q&A. So because this is a webinar, you can use the chat to send us questions as we go. Um, there's also the Q&A feature at the bottom. I'm assuming everyone has lived on Zoom enough in the last two years that you know that feature at this point. Um, but we'll be using that to bring questions together. You can pop them in those places at any time. Uh, but we'll do a joint Q&A at the end as opposed to Q&A time after each presenter. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free and add into the chat all kinds of welcomes. Make sure you should have the ability, I didn't set this up, um, to be able to message everyone versus host and panelist. So depending on who you'd like to speak to, make sure you do that um, drop down in your chat box. 
So we're excited to bring together all of these pieces today. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Claudia. Welcome. Thank you, Mary Ruth. I really appreciate that lovely welcome. Um, hi everyone, my name is Claudia Pineda Tibbs. I am the sustainability manager at Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and I um, am gonna go ahead and share my screen with you all. And I'm really excited to be here. I quickly want to make sure that I stay on time. So I'm gonna set myself a little timer. Um, that's a little pro tip there, just to make sure you uh, hit all your points. Um, and I can also see the chat, which is great in case you have any questions as I am um, presenting. But I quickly wanna just recognize the um, traditional lands of the Alo Ohlone, Costanoan, Esalon Nation. Um, which I occupy and where Monterey Bay Aquarium sits, um, also known as Monterey, California. Um, and today I'll be talking to you about environmental sustainability at Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, so sustainability, I am the sustainability program manager. And as the program manager, um, you are probably all familiar with what sustainability means at your organization. And what I have found is depending on who I speak to, sustainability might mean something completely different to that person. Um, there's a lot of ways in which sustainability and conservation kind of become this um, word that is interchangeable. Um, but in reality, sustainability has to do a lot with um, these three traditional pillars um, that exist, which include people, planet, and profit. I don't love to use the word profit, but um, it is really important in order to have um, a sustainable, long-standing approach to doing work that is great on behalf of planet, um, that also takes into consideration people. Um, and so profit just really means how you're able to continue to fund these projects, continue to fund these initiatives. And there's um, a new approach that is being um, added by the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals um, and their entire program, which also includes culture. So how do you include culture into this conversation as well? Um, and since we're all talking about, um, you know, education and the role of education, um, the role of museums in educating our guests, um, public, uh, social media followers, that's really um, re uh, an important foundation to this work, um, not only the people aspect, but also the culture. Um, what does your organization look like in terms of creating a culture where everybody feels as though they can be themselves, they can be their authentic selves um, and have that free expression? How can they feel safe to hear those messages and to feel activated into taking an approach that is going to um, allow them to do great things on behalf of planet and other people. Um, and the reason why this is so important is because climate change is the greatest environmental challenge of our lifetime. Um, carbon emissions from human activities pose a triple threat to ocean health at Monterey Bay Aquarium. Ocean is our um, the way in which we have our guiding light. Um, we're doing everything on behalf of ocean health. And what is happening with climate change is that the waters are warming. Um, there's this change in chemistry that is depleting oxygen for animals and organisms within that ecosystem. Um, and it's not just impacting ocean wildlife, but it's also impacting our own survival. Um, and so we need to acknowledge that at Monterey Bay Aquarium, because we are a fairly large organization that has a fairly large footprint. Um, that we are doing whatever we can to mitigate the impacts of climate change. And so our vision is really to integrate sustainability, in particular environmental sustainability, into all aspects of the way that we design, build, um, operate the aquarium, and also serve as a role model for our guests and other businesses. And this is really where the education piece comes into play, um, which I'll explain in just a little bit and kind of more towards the end of the presentation. But just to kind of uh, bring this image of Monterey Bay Aquarium to the, to the forefront of the conversation, um, we sit right on Monterey Bay. We are able to have um, a not only fantastic 
view of the Pacific Ocean, but we're also able to use that cold water from the Pacific as intake water, which we filter, um, it goes through our exhibits, and then we filter it back out into the bay. So we have this really interesting way in which we recycle water at the aquarium, which might lead you to believe, depending on um, how much of a facilities geek you might want to um, identify as, we kind of might be a water treatment plant that happens to have really cool animals as well. Um, but in reality, here's what you might not see when you go to the aquarium. You might not see that our aquarium happens to reside in the Monterey um, city, city of Monterey, zip code 93940. But we also have additional buildings where we do our work also within the 93940 zip code city of Monterey. So we have a very large footprint that we need to calculate, take accountability for in terms of our operations, because it's not just what we are doing on site at our main campus that matters, but it's where we are also conducting other business, such as at the Marina Warehouse, our Animal Research and Conservation Center, which is in um, Marina, zip code 93933. Um, and then we also have uh, buildings in zip code 93950, which is Pacific Grove, which is where I happen to live. So we have a fairly large campus. And because of that, we do emit greenhouse gases um, via our operations. Um, and it's important for us to keep track of all of those um, emissions. So we calculate our scope one emissions. Those are um, emissions related to things that we um, that we own, such as our vehicles, our, our you know fleet of vehicles, any stationary emissions. Um, that's anything that we're doing on site as well. And scope two really means anything that we're purchasing. So purchasing electricity, how much are we purchasing? How much are we actually consuming? Um, scope three has to do with um, anything that is more or less considered um, goods and services. So whenever we have business travel, we calculate the emissions of that. Our employee commuting, we calculate the emissions of that. And that's really important so that we can understand um, where we can reduce our impact, where we can um, prevent some excess emissions from even happening. Um, and granted, it might sound like it's a blessing in disguise, but via COVID, we were able to reduce our employee commuting emission as well as our business travel emission. Um, so our 2020 and our 2021 overall emissions were, um, were lower than uh, pre-COVID. And that is very important for us to keep in mind because you can't um, really reduce for what you can't measure, right? And so knowing all of that is extremely important because we can integrate that into ways that our guests can connect to our sustainability um, goals. So for example, changing our LED lights in all of our exhibit spaces so that they are complementary to the um, living exhibits that we have, where we have uh, these wonderful ecosystems and organisms, um, but that the lighting isn't taking away from that experience and it continues to add to that immersive feel. Um, and that's taken a lot of time, as you can imagine, you know, the years of incandescent to um, compact fluorescent to now LED and having a, a large facility takes a lot of um, staff resources to swap all of that out, to test it, to make sure that it, the lighting is appropriate and it's not too harsh. Um, and so we also utilize a lot of natural lighting as well. Um, the way in which we talk about and, our, and we describe our programs, we do utilize um, visuals such as um, panels, display panels to also communicate that information. So we're sourcing anything that is, um, you know, Energy Star efficient. And then behind the scenes, we're utilizing um, the actual body heat of our guests which can create um, a not necessarily stuffy environment, but we're capturing all of that heat and using um, basically a counter current heat exchange so that we can heat the water for certain exhibits of um, organisms that need to have uh, warmer water than you know, our 50 degree water of the Pacific Ocean. 
And what we're doing when we um, have reached our point where we can no longer reduce emissions, and this is something that we're trying to hit every year, reduce as much as possible, um, whatever we cannot um, reduce any further that year, we will purchase offsets so that we can um, reach carbon neutrality. So that basically means um, if I were to go for a run and burn 250 calories, then I would you know, have a 250 calorie snack and then I would be basically neutral at that point. That's kind of how carbon neutrality works and how carbon offset works for us. Um, we will um, calculate all of our emissions and what we'll do is just uh, pay for um, not necessarily credits, but we support projects across the globe that meet our goals, our conservation goals, and our priorities so that we can um, achieve carbon neutral certification. And that's just our um, kind of band-aid solution as we continue to reduce as much as possible. And so we're certifying projects across the globe that really touch upon um, UN sustainable development goals that allow us to continue the work that we're doing in terms of um, ocean conservation work, climate mitigation work, um, and things of that nature. And one of the projects that's really exciting for us is the Million Mangrove Project. Um, it's a project that has also been one that we've funded for our um, on-site events at Monterey Bay Aquarium, which we're just kind of starting again. Um, so we are a not only carbon neutral organization, but we are also a carbon neutral events program. Um, so that means that we can um, pay for the emissions associated with guest stays, their travel um, when they have an event at Monterey Bay Aquarium. And so um, these are the three UN Sustainable Development Goals that we use as, that I use as guiding principles for any of the work that I'm um, using to fund across the globe. And that does, you know, you do have to um, budget for that, depending on the projects that you're funding, it could cost a, a few thousand dollars up to tens of thousand dollars. So it really depends on the budgeting that you have. I saw that question come in um, from you, Joyce. So thanks for asking that. Um, and I was mentioning earlier with culture, um, you know, having that culture of sustainability for uh, staff members to feel like they are a part of this work, even though their title doesn't say sustainability, um, is very important to getting folks involved. And that also allows them to share those personal messages, those personal commitments that they're making with our guests, such as, um, you know, when I go to the grocery store, I make sure to bring my own bag, or when I get a to-go order, I bring my own utensils. Um, having a procurement policy that allows us to prioritize purchasing from local vendors um, also shortens and um, makes our commute from getting those items smaller, but also the emissions associated with that are significantly reduced. And as um, Kate was mentioning earlier with green teams, um, we have a sustainability committee. These are all passionate individuals who just want to do more. Um, and we share ideas there. We talk about what we could do in um, the aquarium as well as in the community and things of that um, nature just to keep the inspiration and the ball rolling. Um, and part of this also includes waste. Um, this is a lot of the public facing side of things as well because we have to be aesthetically pleasing to our organization and, and to the guests that come there. But um, that also means that there isn't a whole lot of signage. So using data like this allows us to determine from a, data from a waste audit, determine um, where we can put in specific signage so that our guests are able to make smarter choices when it comes to um, the waste that they might be bringing onto the aquarium campus. Um, so this basically shows that 40% uh, of what we generate on campus is destined for landfill, um, and 80% of that could be diverted or reduced. Um, in reality, that's very challenging when you're working with a waste management organization that um, doesn't take kelp, and you can't compost kelp because there's too much salt, and it can compromise the um, chemistry of the soil um, that is then given to wineries and agricultural fields in our area, um, as well as paper towels. So we have to find creative ways to divert that waste 
um, which might include things like having hand dryers or hand blowers. Um, and because we source all of our energy through solar and wind, um, then we know that that might be a better choice for us so that we are not generating waste on campus. Um, and then knowing where those hotspots are so that you can engage with the public and talk to them about um, you know, what choices they can make, how they can also integrate that into their home, um, and also some inspiration so that guests can think about how to bring that into their workplace as well and advocate for um, more sustainable business practices. I know I'm getting at the tail end of my presentation, um, but I did want to mention that we also have some of this great, these great visuals um, and uh, choices to make uh, more sustainable purchasing in our in our cafe. Um, we have a plastics gallery where it shows um, plastic items turned into art form so that people can see that um, these plastic kind of single use or disposable items aren't the solution to um, having a lifestyle of convenience because they stay in our ecosystem for a long time. And so I'll just wrap up with some challenges and opportunities. Um, challenges are that it takes a lot of people to do this work um, and not just having one dedicated sustainability person, but making that a part of everybody's job um, really gets at creating that culture of sustainability. Um, and then opportunities really exist in spaces like this um, with AAM um, to share this kind of information, share knowledge with each other. Um, and this is part of education as well. It might be non-traditional in terms of um, educating guests, but you know, sharing best practices and next practices is education. Um, and so being a part of a collective network that is doing this work is fantastic. Um, with AZA, the Aquarium Conservation Partnership, um, our California Green Business Network. And I really encourage you to also check out our website that has been um, put in the chat um, to learn a little bit more about how you can act for the ocean. Um, and you can also sign up for our ocean action emails and we'll add some sustainability tips there as well as other great things that we're doing on behalf of um, ocean conservation to continue with our mission of inspiring conservation of the ocean. So that's it for me. Um, so I am going to stop so that I can um, introduce the next speaker. Um, that is Jeremy Hoffman from the Science Museum of Virginia. So Jeremy, take it away. Thank you, Claudia. Um, so fascinating to hear about the really great work uh, that's going on at Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, I'm pleasure to be here, uh, excited to share with um, uh, the, this community a little bit more, uh, not so much on the side of what what is the Science Museum of Virginia doing um, to lower our emissions, which is a separate conversation um, from more what I'm going to share with you today is, you know, how are we getting involved with on the ground um, uh, action, you know, really direct action sorts of things in this in in Richmond, Virginia, where we're located. Um, and as part of that conversation, I have to go back and kind of reflect on the trajectory that our organization has uh, has taken over the last few years, uh, and 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 reflect uh, on how these different uh, interacting programs have then led led us into a currently funded program um, uh, by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's uh, Office of Education, the Environmental Literacy Program specifically. Um, I know I have to say that and acknowledge the fact that that program's community of practice, which um, uh, you'll hear from another member of that community, and Jen Kretzer, in just a little bit, um, we owe a lot of our uh, uh, evolving thought around how museums get involved in empowering um, their communities to take climate action uh, from that program. So um, anyway, back in 2015, the Science Museum was funded uh, as in one of the first offerings in the environmental literacy program focusing on community resilience to climate change. And as part of that, the Science Museum developed a whole bunch of different types of programming from animations, short uh, uh, individual animations talking about climate science phenomena to doing really funny um, music videos that you can still find up on our YouTube page uh, where we're, um, you know, dressed up like a punk band talking about climate change. Uh, we also had 
programming on our science on a sphere, which is a NOAA uh, a projection, basically six foot diameter projection screen that could connect our uh, audiences to global data sets relevant to climate change and climate resilience. Uh, we also put together a bunch of uh, short skits from our Carpenter Science Theater um, company locally, uh, well, internal here to the Science Museum, led by Larry Gard and now by Kim Jones-Clark. Uh, we talked about really hyper-local data stories, such as things around um, uh, reflecting on how the pollen season is changing, which many of you are experiencing right now, uh, earlier arriving, stronger peaking kind of things, and, and then the impacts on agricultural communities and, you know, kind of cultural identity in the Southeast. And we've also uh, continued to do programming around art uh, and the humanities and how it relates to climate change, more giving our guests an opportunity to reflect on what these data sets mean. Here is a glacial, glacial volume uh, decrease over time, uh, kind of a ma mass balance um, uh, uh, data set. Uh, of global glaciers. Uh, and then this guest clearly could understand what the association between uh, having a very, um, you know, near, near zero uh, mass balance to a very highly negative mass balance truly means. We also did some hands on stuff uh, related to uh, filtering water and creating, uh, you know, kind of more resilient um, drinking water systems. Uh, but we've started to recognize that people weren't really grasping the relationship between um, kind of like a, almost like a survival technique and uh, climate resilience. So we instead switched over to a redeveloped version of the um, uh, uh, preparing for a hotter uh, or a, a, the um, Ready Row Homes exhibit from the Climate and Urban Systems Partnership at the Philadelphia um, Franklin Institute. And uh, we redeveloped this to be about a hotter, wetter Virginia, reflecting on heat and extreme precipitation and how that works in an urban environment. We also produced in-house uh, a, a, a dome screen, um, you know, kind of a, a, a planetarium show related to uh, climate change materials called the Climate or the Cosmic Climate Cookbook um, that's available also on our YouTube page kind of goes into the planetary context of climate change a bit more um, and even talks about the ice ages, which is what you're seeing here on the right side of the screen. Um, we also hosted a, a series of uh, talks, including um, uh, here is Baba Brinkman, uh, who is a uh, wrote a rap guide to climate change. If you're interested in uh, taking a look at that program, it's uh, really fantastic uh, and kind of culturally relevant to teen audiences. Uh, in some ways, he's got a really good um, uh, grasp of how to make these scientific uh, things very approachable from uh, a music musical standpoint. Now, continuing on that that thread of kind of uh, humanities level stuff, we hosted and have done a few of these sorts of events through the years, uh, an art, music, and climate science event called Creative Change. Uh, we uh, hired a, a quartet of um, musicians from the Richmond Symphony Orchestra to play climate data sets, uh, which was really dramatic to show the kinds of, um, you know, kind of natural cycles present in things, giving it a very good musical lilt. But then the dramatic change in the last, in the 20th century, uh, really draws people's attention to it. Now, building on a, um, a, the kind of idea of public forums or participatory kinds of deliberation events, um, this is the extreme event challenge that was developed by the Koshland uh, Center uh, a few years ago. It allows people to kind of take on the role of an emergency manager or some sort of role of emergency management in their towns uh, and reflect on the kind of processes and multi-level kind of jurisdictional issues with um, disaster preparedness and response. Um, and this this actually then helped inform where, we're, where we've gone a little bit more into the future and in, in, right now in the present. Uh, but also we would hold big uh, kind of preparedness events, prepare a very much focused on inviting as many people as possible to interact with the variety of different um, groups that were actually active in Richmond. So we've got like the fire department, the police department, the emergency management groups uh, from around uh, the city and in the county surrounding. We had some local meteorologists and emergency preparedness people give actual workshops. Um, these are super uh, uh, good, like 
uh, welcoming events for your community too. It's a really good way to get people from a variety of different groups, uh, like a city or the governmental organizations that are actually serving your guests. This is a really great way to get those groups uh, in the same place. Bonus points if you get them to actually share stuff about climate science with each other, which is not what this was really focused on, uh, but a large part of the community of practice recognizes that kind of having these summit events, uh, which you'll hear more about from Jen uh, in a little bit are really important. And we've codified this um, as part of our offerings for field trips. Um, so we, you know, offer a whole day's worth of a combination of these different things um, uh, so that classes can uh, choose what they need to be aligned with a variety of the Virginia standards of learning and the NGSS standards. Um, but one, the key thing for uh, this audience, I think, is as, as you start to develop climate programming, um, there needs to be a continual reflection on the preparedness or confidence of your museum floor staff. Um, the educators, whether they're, uh, you know, been with the organization for a long time or brand new, they need to feel confident. Part of that confidence building actually comes through investigating and going through a process of understanding how does climate change impact me or my traditions, my identity, uh, so on and so forth. So what we do a lot is training around uh, connecting personal stories um, whether it be something about being a naturalist or enjoying the outdoors or liking uh, syrup from Vermont, uh, believe it or not, has a climate change connection. So uh, in any case, we got uh, many of these programs evaluated uh, by Randy Corn and Associates. Uh, Kate, Katie Chandler uh, produced this um, uh, graphic for me, basically looking at the effectiveness of these, pro these different programs on two different axes, one being um, the uh, climate science content being weak to strong, and then resilience behaviors uh, promotion with, the, with our audience from weak to strong. And so the top right corner is going to be the best performing uh, on the measure of those two things. And so what we noticed is that the really like um, kind of disengaged uh, passive learning was one of the things that performed the lowest on both. Um, and uh, well, and but the NOAA Science Atmosphere, very, very strong, very captivating data sets. Um, the Extreme Event Challenge didn't really have as much climate science as much as it had weather and disaster preparedness. Um, but the uh, preparing for a hotter, wetter Virginia, which is reflecting on those kinds of social learning, using hands-on materials to investigate how climate change impacts our city in particular. And so we use this uh, uh, um, preparing for a hotter, wetter Virginia alongside hyper-localized data sets relevant to climate change. So things like extreme heat maps, um, flooding maps, uh, impervious surface maps, tree canopy maps, those have all really deepened the conversation around not only the idea of climate change being happening here and now, but that there's a distributed risk that disproportionately affects a, a more and more granular types of communities the more deeply you think about it. So in order to, uh, to get that information and present it to our, our, our uh, audiences, we started a collaborative uh, research um, uh, you know, group of organizations in Richmond back in 2017 uh, with support from the Virginia Academy of Science as well as NOAA. And we brought together both the kind of like city level governmental organizations as well as the on the ground um, uh, community engagement, um, you know, uh, environmental justice kinds of groups all around the same table alongside also our kind of like local universities and our local um, uh, uh, news, news stations. Now, we, uh, this, this method has been reproduced in a bunch of different places, and I'm happy to share some of the resources around how to do it, but uh, basically we put thermometers on cars and drive them around during a heat event, and we get a really highly detailed version uh, description of how temperatures vary. And by recruiting uh, youth, uh, adults, uh, collaborators from a bunch of different organizations, you start to then actually decide where you want to go in a city. Uh, to take the most detailed measurements. What, what did we find? It was about a 16 degree difference between the hottest and warmest place in Richmond at the exact same moment uh, during a heat wave. Um, these are related to things like the underlying uh, land use. This is the well-known urban heat island effect. Um, and we also know from studies uh, and many other places that extreme heat tends to correlate with income. So here on the far right, you see a map of poverty um, looking quite a bit like all the other maps. And so by combining those into a vulnerability index, we were able to show that these areas that 
uh, bear uh, a disproportionate exposure to extreme heat and those risks, they actually see more ambulance responses for heat related illnesses, which is the map on the right, which is really fascinating. What we found in the kind of uh, educational outcomes was that our guests or the people that were participating, the volunteers, the community scientists found a, a, a dramatic increase in their interest in learning about urban heat islands and being involved in that kind of work. So community science creating these science evangelists is a very strong outcome from that work. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about Throwing Shade in RVA, which is uh, one of the programs that we uh, I presented in a, the paper that I wrote for that Journal of Museum Education uh, um, uh, uh, special issue. And so we followed the Steps to Resilience, which is a NOAA uh, Climate Resilience Toolkit approach to understanding uh, vulnerabilities and then actually taking action. And so this is in collaboration with Groundwork RVA, which is a teen workforce skills development nonprofit from formerly Redline neighborhoods in Richmond. Um, and so we led these students through exploring their hazards, assessing the vulnerability going through that exact same exercise that we did kind of academically. We then go around and actually take pictures using a thermal camera uh, of different landscapes around the city, both close to their headquarters and around um, the city to get a better idea of those place-based expressions of the urban heat island effect. Then using those hands-on tools like the ready row homes, uh, they're able to then investigate different options. These are just like simple little um, uh, sponges and stuff that we uh, consider green infrastructure and then they actually can uh, compare their designs and see which one works the best. Then in this case, uh, we actually got them to prioritize and then take action based on what they found. They chose to plant fruit trees in uh, in the schoolyard by where many of them went to school because it was not only they wanted fresh fruit on top of shade. So very, very cool. We saw a huge difference and change in our participants in that first group, um, so much so that the, the words that they were using to describe uh, the urban heat island effect uh, grew um, pretty substantially pre and post throwing shade. You can read more about that in the paper from Journal of Museum Education. I'm happy to say that that urban heat mapping campaign idea has now spread across the country on both coasts. Many more cities are going to do it this summer uh, with continuing support from the, uh, the, the uh, Office of um, uh, well, the, the climate program office at NOAA uh, alongside the environmental literacy program. We've also been funded now to continue our environmental literacy programming in Richmond uh, in a, a significant collaboration with many community based organizations like Southside Relief uh, in Richmond, which was actually founded uh, on the data that we found from 2017, that heat island campaign, Happily Natural Day, which is actually more situated in urban community gardens, um, but those are green infrastructure solutions for climate change in those communities as well. Groundwork RVA continuing our, our, our collaboration with them, which is now an award-winning collaboration. And then Virginia Community Voice, which actually focuses on a particular geography in Richmond to elevate the voice and vision of their community members in uh, developing things like equitable development school uh, scorecards. We're also in collaboration with the City of Richmond's Office of uh, uh, Planning and Development Review, as well as our Climate Action Plan, RVA Green 2050. Um, so with that, I want to hand it a uh, stop and make sure that we hand it over to um, the next panelist, uh, the, the, uh, the very inspiring Jen Kretzer from the Wild Center in uh, New York. Take it over, Jen. Thanks so much, Jeremy. I always learn stuff when I hear you speak, and I really appreciate it. Um, just learning more about your program. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Uh, my name is Jen Kretzer. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm coming to you from um, the Wild Center, uh, also the uh, traditional and contemporary lands of the Haudenosaunee people uh, in northern New York State in the Adirondack Park, um, our museum um, has nestled up here. We're actually expecting a snowstorm tonight with another, um, I don't know, 10 to 12 inches of snow. So it's not quite spring as it is in, I think, many of the places where you all are uh, watching here today, but soon, soon it'll be spring. Um, but anyway, I want to share with you today um, some examples in which our museum is working on um, public climate action and engaging and thinking about this with particularly with young people, but also with a number of other audiences. Um, similar to Jeremy's program, we're also um, 
for our youth work, um, we were significantly funded through NOAA's uh, Environmental Literacy Project, and we've been uh, really grateful to their support and uh, contributions and just the community of practice that that allows. Um, so I want to touch base first on um, this um, graph that I'm showing you right now, a diagram is actually um, was created as part of the 2015 um, UNFCCC um, uh, Climate Action in Paris Treaty. So thinking about um, what's known as action for climate empowerment, but I like to really think about this frame on how museums can work, can and do work on cl climate action, um, and thinking about how museums can through the through all of the assets and resources and um, um, wealth of uh, intellectual and social capital that we can actually be um, accelerators for just climate action in our communities and help to serve as both catalysts and anchors for that work um, at both a, a very um, small local scale, but also at a state, re a regional state and national scale when possible. So um, within the, the concept of ACE, these ideas around how um, we can connect through education, training, public awareness, access for information, public participation, and the coordination of networks, that if museums can look through this framing, um, that we can, we can actually be that accelerant for climate action in our communities and help to build a more resilient and just future that we're all um, looking for. And we know, as uh, Claudia mentioned earlier, that, you know, climate the climate crisis of our is is the crisis of our time um, in so many ways and, and intersects across all different um, all different challenges um, around the world. So I want to share with you a, a few different case studies from our museum that we've been working on. Um, for a number of years. The first is our uh, youth climate um, summits and our youth climate program. So back in 2009, uh, the Wild Center began uh, convening, educating, and engaging uh, high school students on climate climate change through youth climate summits. Um, summits are here at the Wild Center are two day events where we bring together um, um, about 30 different school districts and teams to learn about climate change, um, science, action, justice, civics, um, through a variety of workshops, um, uh, speakers and uh, hands-on project-based um, work. Um, this is, and I'll share with you how much this has evolved over the last um, 14 years since 2009, because um, it really has evolved quite a bit, particularly over on the last couple of years with COVID. But one of the things that has remained um, our foundation, and, and I really heard many of the things that Jeremy was talking about rooted in these same values that we have um, around thinking about our work through a place-based lens, that we're youth-driven, that we're action oriented and solutions focused, that we help to um, remain um, hopeful and with optimism, and that we approach our work through an equitable and just lens, and that that's a, a real center for the work that we do. And we um, think about these values across all of our youth climate, not just our youth climate programming, but our climate programming as a whole. Um, and that's been something that's been a guidepost for us. So our Youth Climate Summits um, provide a very strong place-based knowledge content and um, to, to provide that foundation. And this is really important to help young people connect to what's happening in their communities, similar to what Jeremy was talking about with um, understanding um, the heat island effect in Richmond, um, helping to connect young people to what's happening right in their communities, the impacts of climate change is something that helps to um, activate and motivate them. The climate summits also help to bring young people together, not just to learn about the different things that are happening across their communities, um, but also to take action. And this is a really important part of the work that we've done over the last 14 years. Um, all At all of the summits that we do, we have young people create a climate action plan and project that's youth driven, that helps them to identify uh, local challenges and create solutions, a framework through self-defined action. So it's not something where I'm saying like, hey, you should do this or you should do that, but it's really youth driven. So we're not just um, helping young people understand and feel empowered around um, around the work that we're doing, but it's also around like positive youth development and youth leadership. So it's, it's climate content, but it's um, through the lens of positive youth development. 
So what does this look like in the community? Well, after uh, young people participate in a youth climate summit, um, they go back to their schools and then begin work on uh, implementing their plans. So I'm gonna show just a few examples of this. And uh, it's really interesting because over the years, we've really seen young people um, in schools that have been participating for um, a number of years sort of scaffold their learning. So typically projects start with a school-based project, for instance, like putting in a water bottle refilling station um, and then growing to things that are um, more community based. So while this started as a school garden, it ended up um, at a school in Homer, New York. Um, it ended up being a place where the students were growing food for the local um, the local food pantry. Um, and then it's actually evolved even more um, where schools are working or students are working directly with one of our project partners, which is the New York State Office of Climate Change. So uh, New York State has a program called Climate Smart Communities where young people um, I'm sorry, where communities can get engaged with building climate resilience plans for their communities. And we began inviting the Office of Climate Change to present at our, um, at our youth summits across the state. And they actually, um, the students got really excited about this and, and started leading these climate action um, plans. And um, I think we're gonna share, we'll share in the chat a video that where you can see this case study in action and hear from some of the students that have been participating on these task forces in their communities. Um, we've also really grown our summit. So what started um, as one idea from one student back in 2009, we actually uh, recently just uh, hit over 100 summits in eight countries. So we have a full um, suite of resources and materials online to help, um, including like, how do you plan a youth climate summit toolkit, um, whether you're in person or virtual. We've had a lot of virtual summits um, over the last two years with COVID um, that have been super successful and and really exciting. Um, and these have taken place in museums, in aquariums, in zoos, in schools, in resilience um, centers and communities all over the place. So, uh, and I'm happy to talk more um, with anyone who wants to start planning a summit. I hope we, we hope we get some interest out, out of this program today. Um, it's also taken us to unlikely places. Um, we were one of two museums this past year um, that attended with a delegation um, to the UN Climate Conference in Glasgow. Moscow, which was really exciting to bring our youth climate leadership and advisory board uh, team over there um, and, and having them presenting on the world stage about what, what, why climate change matters to them and what they're doing about it in their communities. A few other ways in which we're connecting with, um, with, with different audiences, whoops, um, is we also work with teachers. So we do educator and educators. So we do educator um, workshops in the summertime. We have a four day residential um, retreat this summer. We also do this for youth. You can find out more on our website. And we've also done a number of programs where the Wild Center convenes I, um, unlikely audiences to talk about climate change. For instance, um, this, this uh, storm, a hurricane that came through our northern part of New York State, where leader, we brought together municipal leaders and transportation officials to talk about uh, resilience and uh, preparing for the future, kind of um, building on um, uh, Jeremy's uh, preparathon, which I, I love that idea. Um, so highlighting those personal stories and impacts to climate change. We also um, hosted another convening that took place actually at a ski center, um, since we're a big winter tourism destination. Again, thinking about like what's the impact that climate change is going to have on our winter tourism industry, and we brought together those um, business and community leaders and youth to talk about this. And then we've also done an event, we do this every other year, where we bring together um, building, um, building officials, architects, planners, um, the folks from the hard, local hardware stores and lumber suppliers um, to talk about green building practices and ideas and to share that out um, at, our, at our museum. So that's been another audience that is a little bit unlikely, but um, a great audience to connect with. So some of the... Um, just lastly, um, some of the considerations we think about um, in all of this is how are we supporting positive youth development in our community and how can we help to create those tipping points? So we're reaching youth, we're reaching educators, we're reaching teachers, and we're reaching these business leaders and influential. So what kind of tipping points can we create towards 
um, towards climate action, um, finding common ground and fostering dialogue, really thinking about how the work we're doing is place-based and project-based learning, and um, of course, civic engagement. So I'm actually going to stop right there. And I hope if anyone's interested, please check out our program and um, resources online. Everything is, is there for the taking, and I'm happy to uh, chat more about that with anyone interested. Oops. I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks. Thank you, Jen and Jeremy and Claudia. That was great. We've had a lot of thanks and praise in the chat already. Um, we have a few questions that have come in, but I actually wanted to start with one that I wanted to ask you all based on the um, issue we've been talking about. I actually happen to have a copy of the JME with me. Um, I found this the cover art really interesting when this was originally made. The climate is changing. Why aren't museums? Um, but this was a piece that actually came out of your article, Jen, that I wanted to put to all of you because I think it is an interesting question to ask about all the different ways of work that you've talked about. You said, how do we reframe the hopelessness around climate? Uh, you both, you or all three of you have talked about the idea of this being like a central crisis that we are dealing with, right? Like the crisis of our time. So how do we reframe the hopelessness to feelings of optimism optimism, excuse me, determination and collective action. So you've all talked a little bit about ways that we do that, but in general, what do you think, in terms of your recommendations to this group of our community of practice that's joined here today, how do we turn this into understanding crisis, but also addressing that, museums using it as a way to address that through acts of optimism, hopefulness, is there hope? <laughs> Um, you know, what's your sort of take on that in terms of how museums are uniquely positioned to potentially do that work with our audiences? And I'll leave that open for anyone. I know I started with a hard question. So I know that I kind of infiltrated your world because I am not an, a, an educator. I am a former educator and I was taking this approach of using education to empower our staff to change our culture so that everybody feels like they can be part of that change. And I think that's really where the hope comes from is within your organization, within your museum, if you can do something to mitigate the impact of climate change, you are doing something. You're creating that inspiration. You're, you can storytell it and you could inspire others to do something as well. And I think there's that delicate balance between uh, what you can do as an individual versus what you can do as within your collective power to change the system and to advocate for things such as um, community choice aggregators so that you are procuring energy from a smaller entity that really cares about people and community and you can advocate for renewable energy in that case that's something that we did as an organization um, so you know, I think it's just really interesting that we have to have these conversations between educators and the people who are doing the um, work to reduce our emissions, because that's where a lot of really great ideas come from. That's where we can get a lot of great synergy. And I think that's where we can continue to share these messages of optimism and hope and that we can do something about the problem. Thanks, Claudia. I really appreciate that. Jen or Jeremy, do you want to add anything or we have other questions that have come in? Um, I, I'll just jump in and say, I think one of the things I uh, I really appreciate being um, a part of a, a panel, bringing in the sort of the, the internal education and the sort of infrastructure piece, because I think it's working across all these different spaces that we need that that's where the change is gonna happen. And I think that finding ways to both empower and build agency within staff, but then also think about what's the role of your museum in this work in your community? Like what, and maybe it's not climate change, but if you look at those SDGs, which I love Claudia, you were so aligned with some of that. And you're like, okay, can my museum take on one of these SDGs and dig in and really think about like where it's happening in our community or look out to your community and say, where are the community needs and dig in on that. And like how, how I guess I think about this a lot, like how will museums stay relevant and how can museums, um, 
step up to these crises that are happening everywhere where it's, you know, whether it's hunger or housing shortages or climate change or, you know, understand fostering dialogue on race, like what, where, where can museums serve this like central role or convening or help to support that happening in their communities. Um, and, and really, I think that's where the hope is, because when you're doing that work, you can build that you can find that hope um, in the in those conversations and in those new and unusual partnerships that you might form. Great, thank you. I always like to lead with hope and optimism, right? Um, a few other questions that we had, Jeremy. You mentioned, of course, um, that in a really in bright red letters, museum educators need to feel confident. Um, you obviously work in a science museum. Uh, do you find that educators are, they have confidence from their existing science background or is there a program, is there training, is there a way that museum educators can become more confident in these topics? That's, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, from when I started, you know, we had people that were 25 year veterans, you know, been on the floor every day, can't, you know, went through all the, you know, <clears throat> but maybe aren't environmental scientists or don't have a lot of background in um, deep questions related to anything beyond like, oh, the greenhouse gas effect is made worse by the emission of heat trapping gases, you know, but once people start to, especially in more uh, politically uh, conservative areas, especially that might have a higher hesitation not only to climate science, but science more generally, um, you can quickly get into pretty standoffish exchanges. And so I think that there's also a certain amount of feeling confident in uh, maintaining a level of, uh, of, you know, transparent, like, you know, it's, there's a variety of levels of this kind of confidence. And so what I found is offering a variety of different types of training opportunities. So like we do the, the Noki um, uh, training materials is, are like a great way to get into talking about global climate change. But then it's like very specific guided, um, you know, I'm a climate scientist. So I, I have the fortunate ability to be able to like know where these data sets are coming from and to align our programming with these specific tools. Um, to make them uh, easier for our audience to understand. But there are some other science communication, you know, kind of platforms out there that specifically link to climate change um, that uh, can help build that at least base level confidence. But if they're not, com if they're not comfortable talking about, you know, uh, how, you know, sea, like sea level change is not just the ice sheets melting. There are some other things going on there as well. And the more that they know that, the more confident that they can be in the presentation of that information. Um, so uh, training uh, both like it, national scale kinds of programs, as well as like targeted uh, investigations of how does localized climate change impact you in your day-to-day -day life. Those two things balance to create a really high level of confidence in some of our educators. Thanks, that's really helpful. So another question is, we have some folks that have joined us through, I think, EdCom Connections who are not necessarily science educators or work in science museums or aquariums or zoos. Um, how do you make this work interdisciplinary? We've said, I mean, the question at the beginning, should museums do this work? Yes. How should all museums, regardless of discipline, do this work? I can jump in just first. I mean, the the issue around climate change is so intersectional. I know oftentimes it maybe gets siloed into um, the science arena, but when you step back and look at it, um, it is it's so intersectional. And it and we actually, you know, I think that the um, you can from any perspective you could find your way into it. One of the things I would suggest, I love Jeremy's suggestions around. Um, 
the Noki training, which is amazing. Um, also, if, if, if anybody has um, had the opportunity to read a book called All We Can Save, um, which came out not that long ago, it's a, um, a feminist perspective on, on climate change, very intergenerational and intersectional approach on at collective essays, and they have an incredible um, like reading guide and circles that you can do with your staff um, or with the public or any with youth like they have it's amazing the resources they have and I feel like that might be a good maybe helpful starting point but I think that there's I think there's ways to come from the into the climate space you know whether it's through I mean Jeremy had some great examples of like the quartet playing um playing climate data the art pieces I've seen those at at um at the the aquarium at the Monterey Bay Aquarium which are incredible I mean there's so many different and intersectional spaces where you can start to bring in justice and civics and arts and literature and history like all of that is is related and and can help us think towards you know what are the what how can we think towards solutions because that's i think right now where the framing is is taking us like what how can we reimagine and make those solutions visible and, and that's going to take so much work and effort across all sectors and all spaces in order to make that happen i also think that um just with the next generation science standards everything is very uh, interdisciplinary. So there is an approach to, there's an opportunity to use that as a framework, um, looking at all of the ways in which I know that, you know, there's a such a thing as being developmentally appropriate, but seeing as how that can be scaffolded for the teachers and the learners that come to your facility, that come to your site, so that you're helping to enhance that um, learning that is happening in the classroom. Um, and I think there were some great examples of, um, you know, prof teacher professional development programs that also exist that probably take into consideration the NGSS um, as well. And we have that at Monterey Bay Aquarium as in, in addition to um, all of our public facing um, interpreter uh, signage. So I think just kind of having that common um hub i guess just having that hub of okay what what would educators need how can they also feel confident how can staff feel confident about talking about this um and i think noki as well as ngss are two great ways to kind of serve to have that serve as your um as your guiding principles Wonderful, thank you. Well, and we have just come over the top of the hour, so we'll wrap up. Um, but this has been three great presentations. Um, again, lots of thanks in our chat for that. Um, it's been wonderful from the EdCom perspective to partner with um, another professional network, uh, which is a, one of the first times we've had a chance to do that. So we appreciate the invitation from ECN to kind of bridge to do what we were just talking about, right? Make sure that we are bringing everyone together for these conversations that are so important. Um, we will have within a week or so an edited version of this, provide resources out to everyone um, and share this out, the video recording. Um, and until we touch base again, thank you all for joining us and we will see you soon. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody, have a great Earth Week. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Happy Earth Week to everyone! Earth Week's every week! <laughs>